lovely dram and you can see here a lovely bottle as well. I love the detailing down here as well. Records back to 1895. Chivas Brothers buying Longmoon whiskey for their blend. This might seem a little unusual for all of you out there, but Longmoon has a very, um, you know, deep link, you could say, to Japan and Japanese uh, whiskey history. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Discover series with the Whiskey Advisor. I'm Uday Balaji. So today we're going to be discovering all things Longmoon with brand ambassador Alan Ironside. Hey, Alan, how are you doing? It's been a while. Hope you're well. Hi, Udi. I'm good, thanks. Yep, it's, uh, it has indeed. It's been a, a few months now since we, I think we last spoke with Abra Lauer, but um, mm. good to be back talking whiskey. Wonderful. Great to have you here. In fact, we started off the Discover series a few months ago, and Abra was one of the first uh, episodes on it. Uh, we're coming back to Longmont. So what do you have in your glass today, Alan? Well, today, Udi, I have got... Um, Longmorn Distiller's Choice, so a lovely dram, and you can see here a lovely bottle as well. Mm -hmm. And you've got it there yourself, fantastic. I love the detailing down here as well. Yeah, it is a lovely touch, that leather bottom. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think, hopefully, well, it's something that befits a whiskey that really is a lovely, luxurious dram, but also something I think that a lot of people, some people in the whiskey industry, and in whiskey circles have certainly heard of, but other people may not have because it's slightly less discovered than ones we've mm -hmm. possibly touched, such as Abelor. That's right. All right, Slanja. Slanja. So guys, before we start talking long one, I've got a request to you as always to please like, subscribe, and hit the little bell so you'll know every time we have a new video here. All right, so I have to start with the box cell. So the reading on here, born during the golden era of luxury, a time of dazzling elegance and breathtaking progress. Uh, I would imagine that this is referring to the whiskey boom of the late 1800s, uh, and we're in a whiskey boom again. Uh, so could you tell us, you know, what it was like back in that time and uh, the story of Longmont? Absolutely. So the late 1800s, 1890s particularly, were a time of of the whiskey boom, as you say. And there was a few things going on, really. Um, one thing was was fashion, you know, much and such the same as today. Once something becomes fashionable, this is when it starts to grow. And, and whiskey really was at this time, partly in thanks, we think, to to Queen Victoria and particularly her, her real passion for all things Scottish at this point. You know, we talk about, um, you know, maybe middle class English people going to places like South America these days or Southeast Asia. Scotland was sort of that place at the time, you know, middle class England really had a, a real interest in not just Scotland, but everything Scottish, be that tartan, shortbread, whiskey and everything that went with it. So it gained popularity. Another thing that was happening as well, though, was, of course, communication. So so transport and and the links, the rail links in particular, um, which I think is pretty apt for, for Longmore in itself, as we'll talk about later, um, were becoming widespread. So you've been to Speyside yourself, Woody. Mm -hmm. Very rural place, quite hard to get to. So when they were taking whiskey by horse and cart before, the railway really revolutionised this and we were able to get to port and transport across the world a lot more easily. Another thing that happened round about this time was, I suppose luckily for us, was the philosopher aphid um, in, in France. And, and this really was, was, was particularly devastating for French crops. But what it meant was that cognac brandy couldn't be so easily produced. What happened was when brandy was once the, the, the drink of choice, whiskey and soda, for example, became the drink of choice during this time. Um, Another thing I think we shouldn't underestimate is the people that were around at this time, the entrepreneurs that were really the driving force behind all this. They, they saw this opportunity in front of them and really took it and run with it. You know, these are people like the Chivas brothers, entrepreneurs that were coming about at this time. Longmore in itself, we, we, we start off with, with John Duff, who was one of these entrepreneurs. He, he was someone that was, was taking the, the bull by the horn, so to speak, and diving into the world of whiskey. John Duff himself, though, perhaps not as well known as um, 
people like George Smith, people, the founder of Glenlivet, of course, but nonetheless, at the time, incredibly influential. He didn't just set up Longmorn Distillery. He was someone that founded Glen Lossy, Ben Riek as well, and a number of other ones. Um, but he wasn't without, you know, trial and error like everyone, you know, I think it's a good, good uh, motto, isn't it? You know, you have to make mistakes and learn from them. And he was one of these guys. He actually went to Cape Town, failed to set up a distillery there, didn't manage in the USA as well, and came back to Scotland and basically kicked on with Longmorn in 1893 was when he began, but the first stills started operating in 1894. So, he started Longmorn, you know, 1894, um, for just 20,000 pounds. So obviously <laughs> inflation, etc. But this was a um, time when a lot of distillers were getting built. And the sort of signature of Longmorn was um, was a malt that was, was particularly luxurious and delicate and very, very pleasing to the taste. And this sort of spoke for itself. And um, there's a number of records from the early, early days of Longmorn talking about this taste. We've got one from 1897 and um, the National Guardian saying here, and I quote, um, Longmorn jumped into favour with buyers from the earliest day on which it was offered. You know, so that's a mm -hmm. quote from a local paper at, uh, or a, a national paper at the time. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, of course, we are. Longmorn is part of the, the Chivas Brothers portfolio. Um, records back to 1895, Chivas Brothers buying Longmorn whiskey for their blend. Okay. So, so we've had quite a long relationship with Longmorn Distillery. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for that. Uh, but, but you know, you said uh, that it was set up during the whiskey boom. I'm sure it must have been, uh, you know, the cutting edge of technology at the time. But uh, we still can't see it, can we? Because one of those distilleries that isn't open to visitors, and those are the ones that you know have that little bit of mystery around them, you could say. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the distillery and what it's like? Absolutely. So uh, as you mentioned, um, it uh, is one that isn't open to visitors yet. Um, there's there's always rumours about this happening, but we'll we'll see. Um, but uh, it is a distillery just outside of Elgin. So Elgin is the, the the biggest city, I suppose you could say, in, in Speyside, in, in Murrayshire. Um, and it is something that's tucked away. Beautiful, little, I say little, it's, it's, it's now four, about four and a half million litres per year these days. Um, it has eight stills, so four, four wash stills and four spirit stills. And um, it is... Uniquely, I suppose, compared to some other distilleries, it actually gets its water source um, from a borehole underneath the distillery as well. Mm -hmm. so partly, this gives it a fantastic source of water. You know, it never runs dry. So it's something that Longmore is particularly proud of is its water source as well. So hopefully, you know, the distillery will be open soon uh, for visitors and we can all come and visit you guys and, and have some of those uh, distillery exclusive whiskies. Uh, but for now, uh, so we've got the uh, distiller's choice here. Uh, but could you tell us a little more about uh, the Longmont range, Alan? Absolutely. So as you said here, um, Longmorn, perhaps less well known, but uh, it's got a very good range of whiskies. Of course, we've got the distiller choice that we have with us today. And um, the the name I have to add as well comes from the fact or the saying that Longmorn was the, the the second choice for or second favorite of every master distiller. The the favorite, of course, being their own whiskey. It has to be. Mm -hmm. um, but this just is a sort of nod to the reputation of Longmorn across the whiskey industry and, and not just, um, you know, within Speyside itself. Um, we also have the 16 year old, which you will find in India as well, I might mm -hmm. add. Um, in fact, one of the, one of the last um, drams I had in India was in Calcutta and was the, was the 16 year old Longmorn 16. It's something that's, you know, when the distiller's choice is perhaps a little bit lighter, a little bit more, um, on the fruity side, the 16-year-old, as you'd expect with that age, brings a real sort of balance to it and complexity. 
we've also got the 25 year old as well and um, then we go into something that's uh, a little bit more i suppose unique which is our secrets of space side range as well so secrets of space side was Shivas brothers sort of wanting to to sh shine a light on some of the lesser known distilleries that we have and um, some of them that have shut down that won't be producing again um, but others like Longmorn who are perhaps less well known. And in that range, we've also got the 18 year old and um, the 23 year old and also the, the, uh, the 25 year old comes into that one as well. And um, so the 18 is a double cask mature. The 23 is a triple cask, as is the 25. Sorry, the 23 is a double cask, actually. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I look forward to trying that uh, someday. But, uh, but you know, you mentioned a little earlier that uh, Longmoon has always been used in the Shivas blends. So I know that, you know, that it goes and it's a very important part of your uh, blending in your blended whiskey, sorry, in your blended whiskey portfolio. Uh, could you just tell us a little more about what role it plays in the blends and how important it is? Absolutely. So um, Longmoon, I mean, at one point, I suppose we're talking maybe that you know before before the '90s when when we started to really see uh, an increase in, in in single malt consumption in general, um, over ninety percent of what Longmorn was producing would have been going to blend at one at one stage in time, and uh, you know, I suppose that wasn't too unique. That 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 was fairly fairly wide across the industry, but Longmorn itself, as I said, with the quote there from the the, the National Guardian. Its flavor sort of spoke for itself. It was incredibly balanced, beautiful, fruity flavors coming through there as well. A whiskey that blenders could easily use for basically many different blends, which which I suppose if you look at it, I'll, blenders would talk about, or master blenders would talk about the, these whiskies as that they're almost like their toolkit, you know, that they're using to build up their blends. And let's just say, you know, Longmorn was, was, was particularly proficient in this. And um, so we talk about Chivas itself. And um, we've had uh, Longmorn used to be part of, of uh, something special as well um, mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, and also, I think when, you, when master managers talk about Longmorn, I, I think of Sandy Hislop, mm -hmm. um, who is uh, one of the Valentine's master blender, but also um, one of the, the, I suppose, the most notable in the industry. Uh, I remember talking to, to him. He did a, a session a few months ago now, and he was talking about Longmorn itself. And he was so excited when it came back into, you know, when it became part of the Shivers Brothers portfolio a number of years ago now, because, you know, he had access, first, first class access, should we say, to this fantastic whiskey. Mm -hmm. Lovely. When you're talking about Sandy Hyslip, I've been watching a lot of uh, yours and his uh, videos on Instagram, and I've been enjoying that. So, guys, you will probably want to go check that out. Uh, but just coming back to uh, Longmon, uh, this might seem a little unusual for all of you out there, but Longmon has a very, um, you know, deep link, you could say, to Japan and Japanese uh, whiskey history. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about that, Alan, just to close up? Absolutely. So um, it would have been about 1919, I believe, um, Mr. Masataka Takitsuru, who some of you may not know, but actually was the founder of Nika Whiskey. Um, so the story goes that he was essentially employed by uh, Suntory at this time. So he went over to Scotland to, to study chemistry, but I think with a sort of side mission to study whiskey as well. So he went to Glasgow University, but during his time there, he, he traveled across Scotland and knocked on, on a few doors basically. And, and some, as you can imagine, were, were more secretive, said, no, we're not giving away our, our secrets of how we make our whiskey. But other distilleries opened their doors and allowed him to basically study, take blueprints and many notes. And Longmorn was one of them. And uh, there, there's su such a great link because you, you look at how big Japanese whiskies became. Mm -hmm. But he went back, he, he he helped set up a distillery um, for Suntory at first. And then a few years later, set up Nika Whiskey 
himself. You know, I think I believe the first whiskey came out of there around 1941 mm -hmm. for Nika whiskey. So he is an incredible figure in Japanese whiskey and pretty famous in Japan as well. Uh, an interesting story that I learned of when I started researching about him was that back in 2014, there was a Japanese daytime TV series mm -hmm. based on Mr. Takitsuru and his wife, who was in fact Scottish. So he didn't just go and get some whiskey knowledge in Scotland. He came back with a wife as well. And then um, this was, you know, a story that's been told obviously across Japan. And um, so it's, it's a lovely link. And we've had people from the Japanese embassy, Japanese ambassador, visit us at Longmorn as well. Uh, and yeah, I think it's just a, a privilege to be associated with such a with such an uh, highly esteemed character and story. Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's absolutely wonderful, and it's kind of testament to uh, you know the openness of people in whiskey as well to to share knowledge and help others grow, even if one day they end up being uh, you know a competition of sorts. But I think it's absolutely wonderful to hear these stories of uh, sharing knowledge. Uh, and thank you, as always, Alan, for sharing some knowledge with us today. It's been great, as always. Uh, but uh, guys, if you want to reach out to Alan, I'm going to put in his details in the description below. And also what I'll do is I'll just link the conversation that Alan and I had a short while ago on Abela. So check that out. And I hope you enjoy it if you haven't watched it already. Uh, so Alan, any parting words for us? Well, of course, first of all, thank you for having me today. It's been a pleasure to speak pleasure. to you as well. Um, I suppose anyone that's uh, out there interested in Longmore, absolutely. The distiller's choice is a fantastic starting point. Um, really accessible whiskey. Um, but please stay safe. Um, you know, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I think it just means, remains to be said. Slangeva. Slanja, thank you so much. Slanja. So guys, that was a fabulous conversation with Alan again, talking about all things Longmont. I really enjoyed that. And I'm going to enjoy the rest of this dram as well. But until the next time, please like, subscribe, and hit the little bell so you'll know every time you have a new video on the series. Until next time, cheers, guys.